And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me, ever returning good brother to the temple, Chris. The man behind Start Playing Dot Games, which we'll hopefully get to down the line, and a man who is reminding us all that we that everybody's got room for a five by five square foot of gelatinous cube, also known as also known as the GUI Cube Project, which is currently on Kickstarter. The one and only James E. Jackson. How you doing today, man? Doing well. Thank you for having me back. Thank you for thank you for being willing to come to come back up to the temple. Um, I, I know we'd initially planned on doing this a few days er, earlier, but um, Mother Nature happened. So it was a case of, oh shit, I better start shoveling. <laughs> <laughs> although, to, although, to my state's credit, they got out the plows pretty quick. Well, the road... Right now, it's, only, it's about 70 degrees here, so I have not seen snow yet. <laughs> I'm happy with that point. 70 de- it's 70 degrees where you are, and... Um, Earlier today, like let me um let me update it. So like, right now it's thirty two. This morning it was fourteen. Oof. No, thank you. <laughs> it takes a cer- it takes a certain kind of constitution score. See what I did there? To put up with the wet weather in my hometown. Oh, I can imagine the saving throw has got to be horrific. Yeah, um, if I were, if I probably have it, I probably have it written as you've as you've got to have tw- you've got to have at least t- at least um twenty twenty eighty if you don't mind me making an A D and D reference. <laughs> I know that that whole that whole D one hundred roll is only for exceptional strength, but I always expanded that to include to have it that if you've if you've got if you've got a twenty or if you've got a twenty and other stats, then you'd ro- then you'd roll for exceptional and those ones as well. Because I like keeping things even. But with that with that said, so when it comes to when it comes to Gu- when it comes to the Gooey Crew project, or as it's properly titled on Kickstarter, enthralling adventures and incredible world. How did this come about? For me or for the project itself? Um, we'll start with the project itself, and then we'll get into how you got involved with it. Okay, so Cube started out uh, in 2019 in, on out of Gen Con is when they released their public introduction. Uh, they're a bunch of very immersive drawn dungeon masters writers creators and they put all this work together into creating a world that and i'm only a part of this amazing group of people and a very small part of that is in fact but um the, the ability to allow hundreds upon hundreds of people to influence an ever-growing and ever-immersive world. Mm-hmm. And I was just one of the lucky lucky ones to uh, start that journey as well. So. All right, I, I got you. Now... How did now? Um, how did you get involved in this? Was it a case where some where somebody involved with it contacted you? So I was contacted by somebody within GUI Cube to help run some some of their content through a convention, an online convention called GUICon at the time, the first time I'd ever heard of them. And I immediately dug into their books, found it so enthralling and immersive. Everything is to the point where there's emotion added into the book itself on top of the 50 or so images that they provide with each one of their books of or each one of their chapters rather 
of their current campaign that just allows you to continue to push that immersion for your players. And I fell in love with the idea of this much content being placed in one world and this much content being placed in one game. So I contacted them after it. I requested some more information, spoke to uh, the famous Alphineus Goo, as he is known, the Mad Wizard himself, and we had sat down, had a small conversation, and he said, you would be perfect to join the Gooey Cube project. And I said, okay. Um, and when I entered, Gooey Cube is not a business, it's a family. I've met so many wonderful people who can write, who can dream stories and weave lore like nobody's business. I know people who can draw and create artwork that is phenomenal, as you will see in the Kickstarter itself. And after speaking to these people and seeing the community-wide building project that they're doing here it is an innovative and new way of thinking for tabletop gaming his dream is to allow there never to need to be another npc because somebody somewhere has created an npc that this will work with and that you yourself can be a part of the world no matter who you are no matter where you come from mm -hmm. And no matter how much you you have in your bank account and that to me was the best drawing factor i have ever heard somebody say and when you get into the content you can see the amount of money that you purchase these for is nothing compared to what you're receiving now taking that into account when i when i did my skimming of um enthralling adventures one of the one of the main things that came to mind is that of living campaigns, you you know the you know like the old RPGA or nowadays Adventurers League and or Heroes of Rokugan during my L five R days and that kind of thing. How similar and how different is what Gooey Cube doing to a li to a um, living campaign? So that is just one of the main, this is one of the main products to help launch that living campaign that you're speaking of. Um, but GUI Cube is not just trying to launch a living campaign. GUI Cube is trying to offer a community the opportunity to get their work published. Um, myself included among hundreds of others that are part of the community. Mm -hmm. And they give you areas within a vast world to um that allows you to weave your own story and then speaking with the the ones who are controlling the large lore the ever-growing world lore itself and then allowing you to weave that local lore in those regional areas and start to develop those adventures and soon a possibility of being allowed to release these under their organization to as your own, as your production itself. Mm -hmm. um, as of right now, GUI Q wants to be as immersive and as real as any RPG can be. And part of that, the way they do that is, is that none of their, everything that they do starts with the why and that started all the way back from why was Zayathe the world created and from that why you find the deities you find how magic works you find the regions and then they take that why and they piece it together with history with folklore in certain regions of the world and they weave that into such a wonderful story for each of these continents to be so vast and different that they've hired 
or rather we've gotten lucky enough to find people who are also as dedicated to storytelling as we are to jump on board as people who know South American history, Eastern European history, um, Eastern Asia, Far Eastern Asia history, and each one of these continents is being developed with those types of lore in mind. For Destia, which is the first one that's currently being written, is all European history, all European folklore. The, the concepts of how the world works is very European based. But once we start moving into other continents like Sundestia, which is going to be um, Central and South American, uh, let me rephrase that. No, it is going to be African and Middle Eastern lore. Another one will be Central and South American. Another one will be Far Eastern and Asian lore. Um, but they want to make it feel as realistic as a fantasy world can be so that you don't ever feel like it's out of reach and that it makes no sense. So that's why they always ask the why. All right, that ma that makes sense. Now, when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the European thing, when it with the setting that's being developed, um, now now a lot of a lot of times I've seen fantasy settings de describe themselves as very European, and it ends up being that kind of pastiche that's become that's become the stereotype of what's known as generic fantasy. Given the emphasis on realism, would it be fair of me to say that that's not their intent? That they are trying to focus on a um, specific approach with Europe and just adding a fantastical element? I would say in with a 99% without being Alphineas himself, mm -hmm. because I do not want to give this company any sort of ill credit for uh, misrepresentation um, that they are trying to build something that feels like history rather than just that generic fantasy that you see as much throughout the world today oh all right now when it comes to the when it comes to the Red Star Rising campaign, now obviously the Darkest Dream is the for, is the first chapter and it and is a um is a pretty um packed book. Now, two que two questions I ha I have on, I have on this kind of thing. It, some adventures have a, a have a few assumptions. Like assu like assumed level, assumed number of um, player characters, and so on. It is that going to be the case here, or is it built with, or is it built with a cert certain levels and certain um certain ca certain party sizes in mind? So that is something that I was surprisingly shocked by. They have your idea of a four party man group that would be basic group parties that most people will run. But they give you at every encounter ways to increase the difficulty or lower the difficulty based on the party. And I think that is unique because if you have a larger party or a more experienced party, you can throw a more difficult encounter at them without having to do it yourself. So they've already thought of that before they, when they wrote the book. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's, I believe it's also, it's also mentioned in the Kickstarter that just that, just that one chapter one book has five pounds of content. Um, could you go, could you go into some of the, some of the um, examples of the content that one could expect in that book? Oh yeah, definitely. 
Um, I have it laying here along with all the other chapters. Um, so when you get these, you don't get these in a book. You get a box. And in that box comes your adventure book, which is for you. A GM's reference book that gives extra information to make sure that you don't get lost when something kind of goes awry. Because we all know that players don't ever like to play by the rules, which is okay. It's what GMs are for. You get a slew of about 20 pre-generated characters. And all these generated characters are built specifically for this campaign um, due to the, the concepts that the campaign resides around, which the Red Star Rising campaign resides around this organization known as the Hanitas mm -hmm. or the Carnival Folk. And what that does in representation of other people to them is very dark and very conflicted, where you start the campaign completely, pretty much hated by everybody within the world, but rather still wanting to come see you because you're a carnival and you're, you make people laugh and have fun and enjoy things. But you're never fully allowed to be integrated into a civilization mm -hmm. and as the story and as the mystery grows uh that you find that these people are genuine if not more respectable because of their their way of living and the negativity that they have been presented with that they become very loved characters in both the story itself as well as most of your parties at least what i've seen with the couple groups that i've ran specifically this campaign through mm -hmm. um they become loved characters completely and you see yourselves in them because let's let's admit it um Dungeons and Dragons hasn't always been the forefront of the world, nor has the geek culture that we live in nowadays been something that's always been shined upon well. And it kind of gives that same faux pas and that same nostalgia to it that people were dealing with during those time frames. Mm -hmm. So back to what's in the book. You get the pre-gens. You get a deck of magical or special items you get a, a deck of what they call gooey rewards which are rewards that you can hand to your players for excellent role playing or rolling a 20 instead of giving them uh, on a skill check rather than just saying oh well you did this nope you get something in reward um, on top of it you have handouts for both npcs within the world within the the, the chapter as well as handouts for areas to bring your players that picture and giving them just a little more to see what you're seeing as a D as a GM. And when I tell you that these artworks are beyond anything I've seen before, I can honestly say it. Mm -hmm. um, and they all have the same art style, though multiple artists are part of this organization. And uh, they've really, truly outdone themselves with the amount of content that you receive for a very minimal price. And they're guaranteeing it. And I've seen it in the chapter books. But the Kickstarter is going to blow up multiple things on top of just the chapter books coming out. Yeah. Now, when it... Now, um... The other, the other part of that question, obvi obviously, regarding assumptions, tied is tied to the is tied to um, recommended le recommended levels because obviously with a lot of adventures and this is nothing new for five e specifically and D and D in general. There's always been adventures with recommended levels. What would you say for this chapter one? What would you say the level range? going into the adventure and coming out of the adventure is just for the, just for this chapter. 
so this chapter, so one of the many philosophies, which is that you will receive in every single chapter book, is the philosophies and homebrew rules of GUI Cube, which you can choose to follow or not. Mm -hmm. um, they want an epic adventure, so many characters have a higher stat count than your normal level one player. They get an additional three level one spells, spell slots, as well as a higher um, max HP or max health. And uh, I believe that's, that's it at this point. Um, I would personally say, a, this is my own personal opinion, not the, the writing part of it, is if you are trying to run this in a basic D and D world with standard array stats, I would say you would want to at least be level two. Unfortunately, in my case, I usually have an unwritten rule that ever starts at level at um, at third level, so that they can at least get some. They can at least dip into a um, subclass starting out. But which I believe that would work well here and like i said with the way the encounters are built to add or subtract hit points based on how well the party is going through the encounters um and the different types of what they call adjustments to their encounters mm -hmm. that third party would be great a third level party would be great however you would have to enhance a little bit of those um encounters um, but you mentioned how you mentioned house rules that they that mm -hmm. they have. I know you mentioned the whole thing with um with start with starting abilities, starting levels, and um extra spell slots. But what are some of the other house rules that they ha that they have in mind for their for their adventures? Given that they want to lean towards it being an epic. So monsters aren't easy. Even at level one, monsters are wicked hard half the time. And the, the epicness of the characters having a utilization of extra spells and um, higher health allows them to still feel like they're fun and exciting characters without giving them those second and third level adjustments. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to... So, since you had hinted at um, the adjustment with ability scores, is it a case where where they'd have... where the... Um, if someone was to roll ability scores, would they be, ro would they be rolling a, um, a different die spread than the whole... Um, D, the whole D6 drop the lowest kind of thing? So, personally, I've read... The only thing they suggest is they say your main stat should be 18. That's their only... That's what I've been told. I don't even believe it's in the actual rules itself, but due to working with the GUI group, um, most of the pre-generated players will have an 18 or 1 stat due to that um, adjustment. Oh. I would. I've personally ran with that specific rolling, where it's we do four d six, um, take the top three, re-roll ones, and uh, that has worked well. But sometimes you have to then go back through and look at some of the how lar large the range could be between your players because you don't want some players to feel super overwhelmed during these hep these epic combats compared to others mm -hmm. now when it comes when it comes to when it comes when it comes to this uh, this setup um how does that account for somebody um if somebody was do is doing the point by um spread for Ability score generation. So point by ability score um, generation, it would probably be very, 
very difficult off the start to just run a level one character through this campaign. Mm -hmm. Um, And I say that in a, but they also do give encounters the ability to degrade as well. So you have one degrading uh, note and you have two improve or upgrading notes. So if the encounter still seems to be crazy hard, even at its normal difficulty, um, they give you something that will balance that out to make it easier. Uh, but for people who want to have that epic experience, um, the the point the point by system might be a little more difficult. All right, I got I got you. Now, n- the other when it comes now when it comes to the um, when it comes now the first the first chapter obviously is the darkest dream which is dealing with the um traveling the um traveling folk um is there go- is is there going to be a chapter involved with that that details what one might expect from one of these carnivals that's inside the book itself that's that's directly um that information is given in chapter 1 all right um, now, when it comes to chapter two, the list of spirits, um, would it be fair of me to say that that one leans a bit more into the, not ostensibly horror, but spook kind of territory? So it's interesting you say that the horror, um, The darkest, or the Red Rising campaign, which is chapters one through five, um, and potentially beyond, but as far as we know, one through five through this Kickstarter, they have Epic Adventure, they have Eldritch Horror, they have Gothic Horror, and all of them slowly start to get a little darker as you keep moving through the campaign. Um, and you can see that, and for anybody that wants to go check out these amazing videos that they've done for trailers, they give you that feel right off the bat without even opening the book. And uh, they just they just finished, I believe, chapter four uh, trailer. And I'm telling you, I had goosebumps mm-hmm. just watching a trailer. And taking that now, taking that into account, would it um, would chapter two be about the would be about the same size as chapter one in terms of the content within it? Yes. So the only thing that chapter two and three, based off the books, are based off the boxes I have, mm-hmm. is chapter two and three do not provide the pre-generated characters in an actual paper format. They are all provided in chapter one, and the stories very much can be played separately, but it's very expected to run from chapter one on. Yeah. Um. Uh, when it comes to le- when it comes to um, levels, you mentioned. You mentioned chapter one having an advised um, starting level starting level of two. Um, what would be what would be the recommended starting levels for chapters two and three? So I personally have not even touched two or three. I am running directly just chapter one because mm-hmm. the groups that I've ran with are running slower than normal um, campaigns because they're very role play based, um, but. And they're taking three to four sessions to even get close to the end of chapter one. But they don't even go to chapter, as far as I've been told from friends of mine who have played through chapter two, is you don't even get to level two until midway through chapter two. It makes sense. They're very slow. 
it's a very slow leveling system, but that's why they give the GUI rewards and uh, the epic level or the epic start of yep. their characters. Now, when it comes to the GUI rewards, the idea the idea mm-hmm. of the DM rewarding for good role play or some what I've come what I've collectively come to call applause mechanics, because mm-hmm. that's basically what it is. It's the equivalent of audience applause in a um pl- in a play. Um, what can you tell me about about the forms that these rewards can potentially take? Uh, if you just give me one second, I'll pull up. So, as an example, I will move my deck. I'm going to pull three cards. So let's mm-hmm. see here. So some of these are advantage on attack rolls, um, advantage on ability checks, um, extra attacks completely. Mm-hmm. My rewards and my uh, character cards, or not character cards, but item cards have shoveled together. So they're the same size. Um, single permanent hit point. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a couple in here that are very unique to the... This one is a one rep point. So this is a very rare and special reward. A rep point can be spent when the PC is interacting with an, art, an NPC to help influence the outcome of the interaction. Mm-hmm. Allows you to get advantages on play, on charisma checks, um, and on top of it, you also get an additional plus two on all charisma checks during that interaction. Um, hero points are s- very similar. They allow you to achieve something that's significantly heroic. A hero point um, can only be provided one at a time. And uh, what the character is attempting must be heroically reasonable um, and to the GM's full discretion. Something that this could be considered would be like leaping a chasm that is a bit too far to cross. Adding a good bonus to help disarm a difficult trap. Doing double damage Mm -hmm. on an attack. Holding up a falling gate when your characters can't normally get out. Things like that. And there's a couple other ones in there, but I will leave those to to fate and mystery. Yeah, I gotcha. Um, and now before I get before I get into the next one, give I need to do one small thing. Now obviously this is now. This is something that that um had been slowly gaining traction, but has got has gotten a lot more traction. Not obviously with current events. When it comes, a lot of um a lot of tables have shifted into the digital end of things. And something I'm curious about is because because with a lot of what I'm seeing with within Darkest Stream. And the and a lot of GUI cube is go is um on the physical end of things. Is support for virtual tabletop something that's been in consideration? Yes. So currently, there there's another part of the group group that's working on getting it on Roll Twenty, as well as Fantasy Grounds. Uh, Roll Twenty has Chapter One on it right now. And we've actually gained quite a bit of just publicity just by placing it up there. People have found it very enthralling and tell friends. And, of course, that spreads by word of mouth faster than anything. But um, it is on Roll20 right now. For We're waiting on the corrections or rather the approval to publish Chapters two and three on the marketplace. And 
I'm get now I'm guessing that if I'm guessing that when it comes to the digital end of things, a lot of the, there will be um, image versions of a lot of the cards and and motifs that are in the uh, individual chapters. Yes. So one thing that I will say, and this I will say with a hundred percent guarantee, is that the one of the most beneficial things that GUI offers is both physical and digital. And I think that is a magnificent thing that a lot of companies, though, of course, you've got people trying to steal stuff and everything else, but for honest people, it allows you to have both versions at your fingertips immediately. So when you buy The Darkest Dream in a physical format, you get the digital copy of it as well on GUI Cube's website. And I think that is awesome for GUI Cube to do so. I wish that there was ways to keep it so that it would not fumble into others' hands, but of course that is beyond the the realm that we live in right now. Mm-hmm. Now, when now um, with each uh, with each book with each um box set and the book and the books within um. Is it go? Is I have to ask the ob- I have to ask the obvious question simply because I've got to maintain my gimmick. Well, each individual chapter's book have an index. Each chapter book comes with a GM reference that references everything that a game master will need for that book. If that's what you're or were you talking an index as in like a table of contents? Um, a bit of a bit of both. I'm specifically referring to the in, to the index that you'd usually find in the back of a book. Oh yeah. So I'm pulling up my GM reference guide right now. So it has appendixes. It has um, references to a lot of the different. Uh, so they have two. Let me go back to this real fast. So they have two. They have what they call the GM reference book. The GM reference book is a lot of those things that you're speaking of. It's giving stat points for each of the monsters. It's doing um, additional information for some of the NPCs that you might speak to. It provides a little bit of extra understanding of who the Hanatas are in the Blue Veil Troop, which is the organization that you start in it gives what they call nsres because we do all know that gms have a uniqueness of being able to bring encounters in that aren't really as random as people think they are so we call those not so random encounters and those are spread throughout the book to help a gm control the story well enough to make it a great story without as most people would call it, railroading too much. Mm-hmm. But one wonderful thing that we have, and I think we spoke about this in our last talk, was the illusion of choice, where a game master has that ability to keep things at a level of mystery that if a game, a story needs to go a specific direction, it can go that way, no matter a choice that a player will make. And players never will know when that happens, or if that ever happens. But it's your job as a GM to make sure that the story continues, no matter what direction they go. Yes. And now with now with a lot of a lot of adventures and a lot of modules that I that I've seen over the la- over several years <laughs> is a temptation to put in um, additional subclasses, feats, or player end of things um, material. Is that something that's going to be happening in this, or is that not something that is planned? This has many, many, many different facets of planning currently. The Chapter 1, 2, and 3. One thing awesome is that GUI Cube gives a lot of their stuff away for free to a point. So on their website, 
you can download the two specific setting based classes that they have created called the spell dancer and the agent of jinx and the way that their deities work is it's not always clerics and paladins it connects rangers druids rogues warlocks all classes have a reason to worship something as a deity and each each deity has its own name for their avatars and paladins and um, worshipers and jinx is one of the many deities within the world and this is your cleric slash bard slash rogue conglomerate that is just weaved very well together and uh, allows you to play a a different feel to certain things and then of course the spell dancer is a unique completely to anything that is very based off of manipulating control of what is going on in combat as well as in non combat encounters by their use of dance which is interesting mm -hmm. now when it when it come when it comes to that use that use of dance um how I'm guess I'm guessing that that there's been an effort made to make sure that it doesn't fall into the trap that often happens with bards. Which trap are we speaking of? Because I can think of multiple traps that bards can get into. Um, the one that the one that I want the one that I want to focus on is is the is the whole the bard has to be a the bard has to be a performer thing and I've Obviously, with the whole notion of dance here, there's definitely going to be that performer element. But um, I've seen I've seen cases, and you probably have too, of people trying to come up with unique and overly roundabout ways to try and justify playing an instrument or singing in the middle of a battle. So I would say. Their, their class is designed that they do dance during combat. They, they're a spell, they're an arcane class developed to use the art of dance to cast a dervish of spells to enhance or manipulate their environment. In multiple ways, and this is all presented in their their class sheet. Mm -hmm. And when now, when it comes to when it come when it comes, like I can I kind of hinted at this, but when it come when it comes to uh, when it comes to other um. Other other casting types. Um, are there are there go are there going to be some are there going to be some inclusions of spells that are more tied to the setting in this campaign? In this campaign, no. In this campaign, you can run the campaign completely fine without either of the subclasses. Mm -hmm. That are they are just options for you to play in. But there is already talk of, and people have already started to write the Encyclopedia Magica, which is another book that will come out that will explain how magic works in the world of Zayathe, and the information will be get given for all sorts of new and unique things. Which make which makes makes sense. Um... Now, when it comes to when it comes to those subclasses, are th I know you mentioned that it's that um when it comes to deity, it's meant to be a little bit more open than than some other setups. But 
do the sub do the sub is le lean towards a um cer t towards a certain class setup or a certain play style from what i've seen and i've not played as a player for either of these classes yet i've seen my players play them um, both are more support based rather than the upfront punching kicking character mm -hmm. um and uh but they do both pack a punch if played pro if played correctly. And there were a lot of fun from what we've heard, from what the information from the players that have played both subclasses, uh, they have been they've had a lot of fun with the unique abilities that each of them get. Which that def that definitely makes sense. Now, when it comes now, um, I know that the ch that um that chapters four that chapters, um four and f four and five are in the are in the wor are in the works, and when it com when it comes to when it comes to those chapters, given that one of them is. One of them in pl implies going into a dungeon. Is that du is that dungeon going to be mapped out within its particular box? Yes. So all of the dungeons that you will receive are also within those boxes. Mm -hmm. And that starts in chapter one. There's a dungeon that's that has uh, multiple um, facets to it that you can fold out into your onto your table and uh and if you're running through roll 20 the the map's already been imported if you if you've bought the roll 20 map pack for it and then that allows you to and it's already been set up for dynamic lighting and all that so yeah. now when it now when it comes to the set the setting the weirded world um would it be fair of me to say that this leans more in the realm of dark fantasy or um, or borderline gr borderline grim dark than it does um, high fantasy? Like I said, with me just being a part of this wonderful world, from what I've been told, is that it is a mix of many different types. There's high fantasy. There's Grim fantasy. There's eldritch horror, and these are these are words that have been used before when speaking about this world. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a post-apocalyptic scenario. Is something has happened called the World Ruin when Galthiantras is trying to create himself to be eternal, and the magic that he had tried to play around with became unstable and broken. And at that point, the circles of 10th, 11th, and 12th circle of magic mm -hmm. was locked away. And the Everflow, which is what they call magic in Zyothe, was now corrupted and warped and now you are seeing in these books the changes that have happened and the differences of what that specific apocalyptic event has now put onto the world and many facets that only the creators that are working on those specific types of knowledge know. All right. Um, given how given how um given how magic is cor is corrupted in that regard, how what how much would that change mechanically when it comes to spellcasters? Would are is there a certain cap as far as the highest level um of spell that's 
a that say a wizard or a warlock could use, or is there a different limitation to reflect that? So, as I said, the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth circles have been closed off. That still allows you the normal level one through nine spells, but there are spells out there that were being utilized that could potentially do incredible far beyond a normal wizard or a normal warlock in D&D's uh, perspective. And those are the spells that got locked away. All right. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask in, re in regard to magic is, of course, something that ties into magic items, and that is flow stones. So flow stones are what are were created after the wall of ruin, mm -hmm. and they are a form of arcane magic that have been imbued into crystal format, and only one type of race known as the Sarth, who are magically adept, are able to harvest these in their raw format and the master crafter has to craft it down to a crystal that can then be utilized in multiple ways which are going to be coming out in future books which makes sense which i can definitely see that and i i am fascinated of, co of course by the imagery of magical firearms in the form of fusils that is a huge story that would take us hours upon hours to explain, and I am not the one to explain that, sadly. There are many, many writers that are working on that concept, but I will tell you that the fusil and the, the creators, rather the class that is being built, the Artificer, is going to blow your mind. Well, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> and when it now when it comes to when it comes to the um that vo that volume of the weir the weirded world which um I th which if I'm not mistaken is going to be running at 250 pages. Um oh, no, the, so to kind of back you up on this one, the Weirded World, chapters 1, 2, and 3, are already out. When you purchase from the Kickstarter, as soon as the Kickstarter closes, you will receive digital copies of those, if I'm not mistaken. But they are already created. I have all of them here in my house. Um, and those are being, those are the current material that has been built for good. For the weirded world but that book only provides a small a large overview of everything that's happened including the history of the world the deities of the world the races of the world and the continents of the world and their goal if you as you scroll through the kickstarter is to take one of those continents and break it down and that's what they're working on right now, which is called the uh, the Westford, or Western Verdestia. And that is almost finished, as well as many, many writers are working on Eastern Verdestia as we speak. Which makes sense, which I can definitely, I'll definitely be keeping an eye out on, th on that. Um, when it... Um, what would obviously obviously each each part of Vedestria is gonna ha, is gonna have a lot of material within it, but if there's a general vibe or a general theme between East and West um Verdestia, what would you say that is? So Verdestia itself is the Eastern European or not the Eastern European, the, the European Middle Middle Age or 
medieval culture and history and lore and folklore that has been utilized in a unique way for each of the the many different uh, races, the many different nations. Um, because one thing that I don't see a lot of in most worlds nowadays is this massive amount of diversity that you would have, that you should have, that there shouldn't just be a human. There should be humans from all over the world. And same with elves and other types of creatures or other types of races, especially if you have a vast world. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the many things that they go over is, is the, the Republic of uh, Xyranthia as where most of the Red Rising campaign starts. But from there, you break out and, and let the Westbird encyclopedia they're going to explain everything around what that where you had been in during those chapters and opening up these little regional lore information and history and it reads so it reads so much like small journals and information on small pockets of things as a dm's table is allowed to then control more and play around but give all these magical and magnificent ideas that uh, come from not just one person but from hundreds within the community uh, and since we're on this topic uh, because the more incredible thing happening not just the encyclopedias themselves but the capital city of Darkenhaven mm -hmm. and the wonderfully grim city beneath of the Gloomport. This is innovation that I've never seen before. Each one of those boxes will have, well, Darkenhaven will have six 17 by 22 inch maps that could be given. You can buy those in that format or you're going to get a normal just everyday map that's going to fit within the box. Mm -hmm. But there's six of those that you can piece together on a table and that's one city of hundreds of thousands of people. And these are one of the unique things about this is that so many people have written stores and lore and encounters and ideas and where things are that the entire city is assumingly uh, populated without also giving areas within the city to be given other air other spots and it started with Darkenhaven which is six six pages of there were six maps. And then the Gloomport grew. Mm -hmm. You know, the Gloomport's going to be nine. And it has, a, it, it, there had been over 400 submissions of shops and places of interest and small little local encounter ideas that are going to be provided in each one of these boxes mm -hmm. that, uh, that is where the the community is uh, going to just was utilized in a way that everybody got that opportunity to put something to the book or to put something to the project. Yeah. Now, first off, first off, I do want to I do want to congrats send my um congratulations for the fact that the the fact that this particular Kickstarter hat is still has 29 days to go, and it's already raised at the time of this recording 73.5 thousand and change. Now, I realize I realize that everything is in flux with these kind of things, but if what would you say would be a release window for chat for um? Chapter 
So as I said, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, mm -hmm. and the weirded world are already created. They're already done. They're already published. And you could have bought them before the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter allows you to get them at a better rate. And sadly, at this recording now, because we missed due to Mother Nature being the evil woman that she is sometimes, uh, that you missed the early bird specials that were provided that made it even cheaper. And those are what I've been told, and I can't give an exact date, those should be almost immediately sent out after the Kickstarter is closed out, or they will start to do the publishing and printing of those to get those out as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. There's talk of them trying to do multiple shipping options, which will cost a little bit more in shipping, but will allow you to get some of the material faster because it's on its way out. And then there's other projects that through the Kickstarter are being funded, and then those are projected for the ending goal of receiving your info, your stuff. Mm -hmm. And I I can I can safely say myself that I will be looking forward to how, to how that develops, because given what you've told me and given what you've and given what I've seen, there's definitely something. There's definitely something um, very unique. I realize that's a bit. I realize um, that's a bit. That's a bit of an oxymoronic statement of something being very unique. Um, but it is. It, it there is definitely something here from what from where I'm sitting, and I can see why you um, why you got why you got in with um, GUI Cube the way that you did. But ta taking all taking all that into account, all that into account, even w even with Mother Nature being Mother Nature because nobody else wanted to, um, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come back up to the temple and enjoy the insanity that comes here. I appreciate it. It's always a fun time. And of, and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is all, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I will make sure next time. Have a beer. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>